My name is Oni Abayomi. It's a privilege to stand here today to quickly discuss on Bembe music, analysis of Bembe music of Obafemi Owode in Nigeria. Now, this area consists of 12 local governments, and the area I'll be speaking on is Obafemi Owode local government in Ogun State. Now, this paper is centered around the analysis of forms and instruments used in Bembe music. Um, Bembe, mu Bembe music is a popular musical style. This style of music is also common in Cuba. But today, my central focus will be on the music of the people of Obafemi or the local government. Now, this style of music is common among the Yoruba-speaking people. And when you talk about Bembe music, the simple explanation I can give about Bembe music is that it's a music that derives its name from a traditional instrument which is called bembe, a double-headed drum um, of a membranophone class, and is played with a cuff stick, held at edges with pegs, and played with your palms or, you know, cuff stick. Now, there's something unique about this instrument. It is made up of two types, two different types of animal skin. You have one at the back and then one, you know, in the front. And this makes this music, you know, unique. And when we also talk about this music, this music is used for two basic things. One, for religious purpose and also for social purpose. Now, the religious purpose involves using this style of music for <coughs> worship of you know, um, deities in Yoruba land, such as Shongo, Eshuelegba, Oshun, Egungun, Ogun, Shokpono, Oya, Obatala, and Iyemoja. The Bembe worshippers, they use this style of music, or this particular music, for the worship of you know, these um, deities. And the social aspect of this music is that this music can also be used for you know, celebration within the society. They use it for entertainment <coughs> purposes, you know, such as naming ceremony, burial, things like that. Despite the fact that, you know, it's a traditional and, you know, local music. This music is played in most of the Yoruba lands in Nigeria and is further passed from one generation to another through oral process. This has been a general conception about African music, that African music is passed from one generation to another through oral process. African music tradition has evolved through the process of oral transmission, Oya Kilome. If you don't know Oya Kilome, it's sitting down there. Hence, the music has been used in preserving our cultural values from one generation to another because Africans believe you know, in, the, in, the, in transmission of knowledge through oral process. Bembe music in Obafemi Wode local government area in Ogun State has been prominent in social, musical, religious practice of the people, and the major musical tradition mostly celebrated in Egbe and Mosul. Now, it is a common um, perception in Yoruba land. They say, oh, let's go and worship Egbe, let's go and worship um, Mosul, Ere, things like that. So these musicians, they use this style of music in worshiping you know, um, these gods. Historical background of Bembe music in Obafemi Wode local government. A man called Baba Arifayo is referred to as the custodian of this music. He was the one who brought this style of music straight to Obafemi Owode. He inherited this music from his father, who happened to be an Ifa worshiper. And from there, you know, he passed the music to his um, generation, to his children. Now, as I'm talking, the children are the ones performing the music, and people invite them within the community to come and perform you know, play for them in any occasions. And people also consult them for spiritual purpose. And that is why I said, you know, this style of music is also used for what, for religious, you know, purpose. Structure and form analysis of Bembe music of Obafemi Now, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this presentation basically <coughs> on the perception of the musicians. So I'm not going to follow the theoretical framework of Western music um, pattern, the way we score music or the way we analyze music in the Western world. So I'm going to follow what these people said you know, about their music. They have three major forms of um, this music. Number one is called um, Arago, 
Arabo is a kind of music that is played you know, at the beginning, which they use to acknowledge unseen forces around them. They use this music you know, to acknowledge powers that you know, I don't understand. But they have to do this before they start performing. It consists of a steady ostinati framework. The tempo of this music is basically slow. Arabo movement, in Arabo movement, the master drummer plays a lot of syncopated rhythm because the music is slow in terms of his performance. So they play a lot of um, improvisation in the process and interjection. The sub rhythm players are repetitive and polyrhythmic movement of the drums because they have various instruments playing underneath. The second one is called songa. Songa is mainly used for entertainment purpose because I said earlier that this music is used for religious and then social worship. They use songa for entertainment um, purpose. It is lively in nature, the rhythm is free and the beat is regular, but it can only be at the discretion of the master drummer and the lead singer. They determine the tempo and the pace of the music because they are the ones in charge of the music. Songa movement in Bembe's time may seem to emerge from a collective social perception because this musician, they try to bring in what is common within the environment into the music just to carry their audience along. And then the last one is Wariwo movement. This movement in Bembe music is highly rhythmical and percussive in nature. The music is associated with religious worship and related you know, contests. Wariwo is characterized by a fast tempo from the beginning to the end because of the purpose that this music is used for. The master drummer manipulates relatively, relatively set rhythmic movement by communicating with other drummer and the masquerades such as Panla, Pabialaja, Olubojo, Paramole, Olewa, Lagbondoko, Agbomola. These are the masquerades, or should I say the, um, the deities that this music is used for. Whenever they go out for celebration, they play for all these you know, um, masquerades. The master drummer maneuvers the music by playing a lot of improvisation and proverbial um, lines in the process in which he used that to communicate with the masquerade or the other drummers. The classification of instruments in um, Bembe music. Basically, there are two um, classification of Western, sorry, African music, musical instruments that are involved in the performance of um, Bembe music, and they include um, membranophone and then idiophone. There are five membranophones used in Bembe music, and they are Iyailu Bembe, Eji, Omele, Omele Kenkele, Omele Atele, and Akuba. Now, this is the picture of Bembe um, drum, and you can see the pitch. It moves in perfect third, and this instrument is the center or characterizes the Bembe um, music, then followed by Eji, which is next to Bembe, and the movement is always in perfect fifth, or the tuning of the instrument is in perfect fifth, then followed by Omele Shaju, then followed by Omele Atele, followed by Akuba. Akuba is alien to this music. They just brought this instrument in to modify you know, the music. Then the idiophone consists of agogo, and you can see the rhythmic movement of the instrument there. Then followed by shekere, which is called um, ratu. And you know, this instrument also plays a rhythmic um, effect in Bembe music. Then finally, Obafemi Awode local government is one of the local government areas that came into existence through 1976 local government area reform. People of Obafemi Awode speak Egba dialect in that area. So this also affects you know, their music. Bembe music is performed in different contexts, such as religious, which includes worship, appease, evoke, and then prayer. Why the social aspect involves festival, communion, celebration, coronation, and entertainment. The research discovered that Bembe music of Abafemi Wode has its own ozombo, just like ozom, just like dundu and bata. So in this um, style of music, there are um, instruments that are involved in the ozom of Bembe music. Recommendation. Further research in this type of traditional music is necessary to unravel further discovery of certain norms and practices emb embedded in rich musical traditions of Africa. Furthermore, ethnomusicology ethno research, which promotes cultural heritage of Africa, should be carried out to show the world the aesthetic and musical richness of African music. Governments, corporate organizations, and music enthusiasts 
should support Bembe music financially and also help them help to produce more albums so as to circulate the music both in Nigeria and the entire world. Finally, technology should be introduced into sharing, storing, preserving, and documenting African music for posterity state. Now, before I go, This is the religious aspect of this music. You know, what they do before they start performing. Now this is the first movement of the music, Aragbo. was actually playing you know a communicative role to tell the singer that now you can come in now the movement of the music has changed this is songa for entertainment purpose And this is Wario, very fast and, you know, speedy. This is how they play from the beginning to the end. And at times they can have two master drummers, so they swap. While one, um, one is tired, then the other one will continue. Thank you. My name is Dr. Yobadi. I'm a PhD student here um, in the Department of Theatre and Dance. And I'm here to present a paper titled Queens in Flight. Fellas, Afrobeat Queens, Performance and Transnational Imagination in the Production of Black Feminist Diasporas. For her fluidity and her capacity for conceptual contradiction, the figure of the Afrobeat queen poses serious <coughs> challenges to the Nigerian feminist movement. Yeah. One moment, the queen emerges as a visible evidence of the excrescence of Nigeria's postcolonial patriarchy. Another moment, she becomes symbolic of a kind of sensuality that exists only as utopia for traditional Nigerian feminism. More often than not, the queen, as a dancer in Felakuti's Afrobeat, is dismissed as inconsequential in the overall making of the music and its politics. Thus, she is invoked typically to highlight the mastery and masculinity of her husband and creator, Felakuti. As creator, Fela is generally credited as the force of imagination from which the queen takes her creative existence. In the same vein, he is held as the husband to whom her desires are channeled. In this imagination of the Afrobeat queen, she is domesticated to the extent of being objectified, stripped of desire and potency. With this discursive stripping of the queen in mind, my paper examines the ways that her perceived impotence has been reinterpreted within performance, within diasporic performance moments. In other words, this paper examines <coughs> some of the ways that she has taken flight from the, Afrobeat, from the Africa Shrine in Lagos, Nigeria, and resurged in the bodies of other women in diaspora, both as a symbol of power, strength, 
and self-worth. In this process, she challenges the overlapping discourses that constrict the terms on which her subjectivity has been understood. This flight, which I contend that the queen takes, appeals to an understanding of the ways that time, space, and movement might collapse into one another during performance. This paper also examines the way that the queen generates a black feminist diaspora through the affective dimensions of her performance. That is, how is diaspora implicated in her ability to take flight and resurge in diasporic contexts as a uniquely post-colonial phenomenon? I also ask, in what ways might the Afrobeat queen reveal new manifestations of black feminist diaspora that challenge the comprehension of diaspora as exile and displacement? How does the Queen's work offer insights into the potential of performance to sanction momentary manifestations of diasporic subjectivity? What is blackness in this conceptualization of black feminist diaspora? In responding to these questions, I turn to three performance moments. The first one is by a woman named Wumi Olaya, a British-born and Nigerian-raised singer, dancer, and choreographer. The second performance I engage today is by a Japanese singer and dancer named Ayayem. The third performance I engage is a, an online photo album by a photographer named Ali Muhammad. Each of these performance moments differ in the context of their enactment, and they, their primary subjects represent disparate modes of diasporic subjectivity. I think I'll, I'll work without it. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll work without it. So each of these performances differ in the context of their enactments, and their primary subjects represent disparate modes of diasporic subjectivity. But for the single fact that they both they all work within an Afrobeat aesthetic as queens, these women differ by race, nation, and personal history. I engage these performances to bring into focus some instances where the Afrobeat queen has researched in other women's bodies in order to suggest that these iterations of a manifestation might chart a tentative or even tenuous understanding of a black feminist diaspora. So who are the Afrobeat queens? The Afrobeat queens are the women who worked as, are the women dancers and singers who worked as part of Fela Kuti's Afrobeat music. And for the sake of uh, people who are not familiar with Afrobeat music, this form of Nigeria, of protest music that emerged in the 70s and eight, developed in the 80s and evolved even till now and has spread across the world and was established or founded by a man named Fela Kuti. You might be familiar with him, you might not. But these women I'm interested in are his wives who worked with him as singers, as dancers, as casual laborers, if you may. They typically worked as backup singers, provi providing some of the more mellifluous sonic elements in Fela's song. As dancers, gyrating vigorously and sensually to the fast-paced and heavily political lyrics of the music. As casual laborers, supporting Fela's work both off and on stage, as stagehands, housewives, and advertisers. Or, of course, in any combination of these responsibilities. During performances, the queens were adorned in two-piece Ankara dresses. One piece that would cover the breasts and a skimpy skirt of the same material to cover the pelvic region, but which reveals her legs all the way up to the upper thighs. Their tight-fitting costumes would reveal both the midriff, the thighs, and outline the buttocks, which would gyrate violently to the fast-paced music. In her essay titled, Think in Africa, Vivian Goldman describes the, the queen's dancing as Fela's attempt to conjure the, quote, primeval pussy power, end quote. This representation of the queen has framed the public's perception of them as mere prostitutes. So a number of elements combine in making um, the queen into an Afrobeat spectacle. The queen's waist beads help punctuate, help highlight the punctuation of the hips and the buttocks, such that the Nigerian cultural dances that they derived from became repurposed for the sensual arts that Afrobeat became. The dance required complicated but controlled pelvic movements in random combination of circular and punctuated hip sequences that left the dancer's buttocks gyrating in its wake. The decorative makeup that derived from ancient Egyptian makeup traditions featured a combination of blue, orange, red, and green painting and was overlaid with dots of white chalk 
over the eyes and around the cheeks. The dotted pattern of white gestures towards the symbolism of purity, <coughs> predominant in Yoruba spiritual practice. And I was supposed to show an image while I'm, I'm talking about this, so I'm sorry, you have to use your imagination and stay with me. The dotted pattern of white, of white gestures towards the symbolism of purity predominant in Yoruba spiritual practice. Laced around the eyes, the white symbolizes, becomes symbolic of extraterrestrial vision that some women are believed to possess in Yoruba culture. The combination of these elements of chalk, of beads, dress, song, music, and dance combine as central in the making of the queen as an entity who reconciles performance practices and philosophies from different cultures. On another level, the queen's body traces the archaeology of, col of colonial power on the female body, particularly as it rigs erotic desire and erotic imagination in favor of the man upon whom the tripartite forces of colonial polity, religion, and trade has invested often arbitrary powers. <laughs> the heavy plaster of makeup at once beautifies the women as it erases them, leaving one queen indistinguishable from the other. Even within these layers of subjugation, the queen yet reveals a world of possibilities, particularly as evidenced in her ability to generate affect through her sensual performance. In light of these considerations, how then might the figure of the queen be exca exca excavated as one of feminist possibilities, considering the overlapping discourses that constrict her at home? So I was meant to go into this theoretical stuff about diaspora, but I'll just skip that. I have five minutes. And I would go straight into my analysis. The queen confounds Fela's patriarchy in her ability to reemerge in and through the bodies of women across space and who live different realities of diasporic subjectivity. She generates affect, I argue, through her production of erotic energy and her sensual embracement of the libido. In producing affect through performance, therefore, the queen generates energies that open up possibilities for collectivities to form based on desire, on empathy, and or identification. In this sense, her perceived strength in executing highly dynamic hip and body movement in sensual stimulating ways combined with her imagined erotic freedom to amplify her potential to create affect. Unarguably, this notion of erotic freedom is, rather, <coughs> is a rather constricted one in that she is married to a patriarch, Felakuti, and therefore unable to fully explore, at least publicly, the possibilities of homoerotic desires. Nonetheless, one may argue that this freedom might, not be f might be found not in her ability to make public her embracement of her own body, but he in her ability to explore the breadth of her body's expressive limits through dance. And so I'm looking first at um, a Japanese dancer and singer, choreographer. Ayayem is a Japanese dancer, singer, choreographer who finds expression of, for her blackness in Felakuti's music. The progeny of a biracial grandfather who was half black, half Japanese, Aya claims her blackness in black cultural expressions like hip hop and R&B. And even though she incorporates these diverse styles in her work, she approaches them from the distinct standpoint of an Afrobeat queen. Aya, Queen Aya, as she sometimes calls herself, performs as one of the singers and dancers in Japanese Afrobeat band Afrofunk System. In the last few years, Aya has remained central to the successful hosting of celebrations in Japan. Aya, who also leads a team of other queens, performs in spaces like art clubs, nightclubs, wrestling rings, and city halls. And if you don't know celebration, celebration is the annual celebration done in Nigeria and across the world to celebrate Felakuti. And it's, it's growing pretty much. Besides just naming herself queen, Aya incorporates into her performances some of the signatures of the Nigerian Afrobeat queen. In some appearances, Aya replicates the bearing of the legs and the midriff while enacting free-flowing movements that involve creating circular patterns with her extremities. Her appearances range from group choreographies executed with fellow queens to solo dance renditions to some of fellow um, classics. In such performances, the queens perform alone to the disembodied voice of fella. In so doing, 
they become the focus of the performance in other kinds of performances. And this is more of a replica of Fela's model. The queens are part of a larger ensemble of live instrumentalists who play either to Fela's songs or play a band original. In the latter model, the women are more constricted in the dynamics of the movement they can execute. However, in both performance styles, the core of the movement generally reside with in the hips and the butt, around the hips and the buttocks, which is characteristically, characteristically flexed and contracted in sync with the arms. In a recent performance of Fela Kuti's song, You No Go Die Unless You Won't Die, Aya leads a team of dancers in her interpretation of the 1976 tune. You No Go Die roughly translates, You Will Not Die Except You Want to Die. One minute. In conclusion, <laughs> so I was going to look at Aya's performance and put it in conversation with um, a British um, queen who incorporates the, the figure of the queen into her, her works and in conversation with a, a set of pictures of queens uh, in, in Dallas. So there was a photo shoot and people posed as queens and just to make a compar comparison between these three performances. So in these performance scenarios, the Afrobeat queen is reimagined by women in Asia, in Europe, in the United States, as a canvas upon which erotic autonomy can be impressed. While these women define themselves as diasporic through performance, the nature of this diaspora in, to which they subscribe is not necessarily one of displacement or loss or longing, but one of affect. In other words, their diaspora is constituted in and through the affective di identification with the ex expression of erotic subjectivity which the figure of the Afrobeat queen both embodies and emits. And even though phenomenon like migration might figure in, for example, Wumi's process of becoming diasporic, her, performs can, her performance cannot simply be summarized as a natural extension or a duplication of Afrobeat. In, thinking about, in this thinking about the flight and resurgence of the queen, performance and the body become crucial in the forging of new diasporic imaginations. For Aya, her diasporic subjectivity resides to a less extent in the volume of black blood that runs through her veins than in her ability to become diasporic through the Queen's performances of dance and music. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to see so many folks here at the music session. Um, indeed, that is the rather long-winded title to what is five sections and a conclusion. First, taking from slaves. The British Museum has owned this drum since before it even opened its doors in 1759, the year of George Frederick Handel's death. The drum was made in Africa probably by an Akan craftsman in what is now Ghana or Ivory Coast during Handel's life. Presumably, it crossed the Atlantic on a slave ship belonging to a crew member or perhaps an honored passenger, unlikely have, to have belonged to a slave. It's possible that the drum was confiscated from slaves after the banning of drums and drumming in South Carolina in 1740, following the Stono Rebellion. The drum ended up in Virginia, where it came into the possession of a Reverend Clark. He sent it to Sir Hans Sloan in London. Sloan was an ethnomusicologist avant la lettre, inasmuch as he published one of the first transcriptions of slave music visiting Jamaica in 1687 88. He later became a slave owner through his marriage to a Jamaican heiress. Sloan had a very successful <coughs> career as a medical doctor, being a physician to successive monarchs and their children. He also promoted the drinking of milk chocolate. He was secretary and eventually president of the Royal Society. An inveterate collector of natural, ob natural history, objets d'art, books and manuscripts, Sir Han's collection was used to found the British Museum. I've yet to determine whether Sir Hans attended any Handel performances, but both were servants of the royal family 
and had many friends in common among the members of the Royal Society. After their deaths, the story was told that Handel, visiting Sir Hans at his house, put a piece of buttered toast on one of Sloane's manuscripts, much to the old man's disgust. The drum is considered of such importance that it is featured in A History of the World in 100 Objects. Second, buying of slaves. Quote, I would have you buy seasoned Negroes both for Principio and Virginia works too. So wrote William Chetwind, executive partner of the Principio Iron Works in Maryland, from his family's country seat at Grendon, Warwickshire, in England, to John England, the manager in America, on August the 19th, 1726. Chetwind, he up in the uh, top left here, was an MP and a lawyer. His brother Walter, also an MP, was paymaster of pensions and thus responsible for the office from which George Frederick Handel collected his royal pensions and that paid the king's bounty to the Royal Academy of Music. Their distant cousins, below the line, were actively involved with the Royal Academy of Music. Walter Chetwind, Viscount Chetwind, occupied the family seat at Ingester, near Stafford, and was a financial subscriber, while his brother, William Richard Chetwind, also an MP and a Lord of the Admiralty, was a director. These two gentlemen were investors in the Royal African Company, as was Handel. Two years after that letter, Augustine Washington, father of President George, became a one-twelfth partner in the Principio Ironworks. George Washington's interest in both slaves and music is well known. While Principio was on its way to becoming the leading iron producer in North America and using much slave labor under the guidance of one William Chetwind, his cousin was enjoying the best opera in Europe. The slave economy and music were intimately related. Third, investing in slave trading voyages. A single copy of a publication titled the names of the adventurers of the Royal African Company of England is known to us. Dated 9th May, 1720, it is a mere six pages in length, and it lists the investors in the company, identifies those who are qualified to be an official, and the number of votes each investor has. Originally established in London in 1672 to secure English trade with West Africa and the Americas, particularly in gold, ivory, and slaves, the company had long since ceded its monopoly to private trading interlopers, but it was still active and responsible for a string of forts along the West African coast. Looking at the document last year, I found among the 1,000 names, Mr. Frederick George Handel. Not the usual form, given the reversal of forenames and the misspelling of the surname, but the musician, nonetheless, which is proven by the company's records at the National Archives. Transfers of stock were recorded in large ledgers and signed in most cases by both parties. Two pairs of buy and sell orders exist for Handel. You can see his signature down in the bottom right hand corner there. Other investors found on the list include Handel's longtime London friends, John Arbuthnot, Bernard Granville, his brother-in-law, Sir John Stanley, and most importantly, James Bridges, Duke of Shandos. Handel's patron, for a year or so, from the summer of 1717 to the autumn of 1718. Females comprise about 12% of the investors, and among them are the king's mistress, Melusine von den Schulenberg, the Duchess of Kendal, who was the mother of two of Handel's probable students, and the Countess of Kielmansegg, whose husband probably commissioned the water music from Handel, first performed in July of 1717. 
Handel wrote numerous works while he was under the patronage of the Duke of Chandos, including Asis and Galatea, Esther, and various anthems. In retrospect, Esther has come to be regarded as the first English oratorio. Five works later in this genre, Handel produced Messiah. Were it not for Chandos patronage and subsequent historical contingencies, of course, it is conceivable that Messiah would not exist. Esther's performance history may have some bearing on Handel's second investment in the Royal African Company, made June 23rd, to the extent that the work was considerably revised and extended for a summer performance that year. Fourth, a musical instrument funded by profits of slavery. The artifacts of slavery are not only the manacles, branding irons and whips, or the slave's own possessions, but also the furniture and objets d'art funded by slavery's profits. One such item is this harpsichord chamber organ. I regret to say the chamber organ section, which would fit underneath here, is no longer excellent. Uh, this instrument was made by John Crang of London and is now in the Historic Musical Instruments Collection of the University of Edinburgh. It's a remarkable survivor, for sure. It says on the name board above the double keyboard, this organ and harpsichord were a present from Beeston Long Esquire to his sister, Mrs. Drake. Beeston Long was a West India merchant, primarily a sugar importer, whose family owned Jamaican plantations. A leader among those merchants in London, Long was, quote, always a warm friend of the interest of the planters and a faithful advocate on every occasion. According to his nephew, Edward Long, now notorious for his unabashedly racist views laid out in great detail in the history of Jamaica, 1774, Jane's, um, Beeston's sister, Jane, had married his business partner, Ro partner, Roger Drake, in 1733. Roger Drake was active in the East India Company, being uh, chairman and deputy chairman during the 1750s. Both Long and Drake were governors of the Foundling Hospital, and that was the institution that, um, for which Messiah was used as a fundraiser for many years. Fifth. Uh, the profits of slavery were used to fund opera seasons. Uh, of the 172 men who were directors or subscribers to the uh, Royal Academy of Music during the 1720s, 32% of them had a financial interest in the slave trade. And during the 1730s, Handel used his own savings, invested in the South Sea Company, another slave trading company, to cover the deficits of the opera company <coughs> that he ran. To conclude, given the primacy of the elite as patrons and investors in the slave-based economy, it is not surprising that many individuals can be shown to have participated in both. Nor is it surprising that such dual involvement has been ignored, occluded, or obscured by music historians and biographers. But as studies of the visual arts and the built environment have shown in recent years, some of the profits of slavery were used to create works of lasting aesthetic merit for the privileged few. It's time for music history to recognize, investigate, and acknowledge the role played by slavery's profits in the creation of the objects it studies. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Within the time frame, I want to speak on Fela on Broadway, seeing Fela Anikula Kukuti through the eyes of the Fela musical. Uh, the aim of this paper is an investigation into the Fela musical written by Bill T. Jones and Jim Lewis. We know that a musical is uh, a form of theater, television, of film production that combines songs spoken dialogue, acting, and dance to tell a story. The musical is based on the music message and activism of Fela Nicola Kukuti. 
and it's also, uh, it premiered on Broadway on October 2009 and has since taken to several countries in Europe and Africa. The musical has also been a major landmark in the propagation of Afrobeat in a global context since the death of Fela Anikula Kokuti in 1997. We've had several uh, attempts which has really worked in propagating Afrobeats outside the shores of Nigeria. And uh, we find this quite intriguing uh, by uh, a set of Americans who came together and decided to, to you know, build up and then reenact Fela Nicola Kutti through uh, the musical. And then we find it as an attempt, like I said before, by African American in the diaspora at preserving, promoting, and projecting the image of Afrobeat within and outside the shores of uh, Nigeria. Now, what does the paper really now seek to establish? We want to examine the musical that speaks to the world about the overwhelming contribution of a musical icon, Fela Nicola Kokuti, uh, to the development of music, Afrobeat music, the emergence of the music and the development of the music in Nigeria and uh, across the globe. And then the paper also investigates the reception of this music outside Nigeria, thus giving those of us from Africa palpable insight as to the new ways of promoting and preserving our cultural heritage in this present age. Ultimately, it will analyze the creative dimensions of the production, uh, the musical production as important elements in understanding how Fela's identity is defined, constructed, and reformed on the Broadway. Afrobeat is about Fela Nicola Kokuti. And when you look at the creative dimensions of Fela musical, it's also centered around this man, Fela Nicola Kokuti. And so we're talking about the man, the music, and the message. The emergence of Afrobeat has been attributed largely to the creative ingenuity of Fela Nicola Kokuti. And we find his endowed instincts sacred fire and the ability to infer or apply theoretical construct and being also nurtured in an appropriate environment as a major contribution to the emergence and further development of this uh, music. Fela also undertook the spread of Afrobeat music and uh, the gospel of Pan-Africanism all over the world. Fela believes that Afrobeat is not just about music alone, but it's about a message, a message about the emancipation of uh, Africa from uh, mental slavery and from the oppression of the, the evil men. And then the music too. Afrobeat, what is Afrobeat? It's a musical genre or style which incorporates jazz music with African roots. It has also been defined as a combination of American funk fused with African instrumental styles popularized in Africa in the mid to the late 60s. So we find Africa, um, Afrobeat as a confluence of several musical styles, both indigenous and Western style uh, uh, that, that, that Fela brought together and then created in the making of the genre. Now, the message. The message of Afrobeat focuses on the emancipation and uh, uh, on the total emancipation of the human race from the pangs of oppression, victimization, apartheid, segregation, looting, and a host of other social vices and human right abuse. And I guess that is all that Fela Musical really incorporates and that is the message that Fela Musical is trying to also preserve as seen in Afrobeat. But when we look at the Fela Musical now, we need to ask ourselves, oh, sorry.
let's look at the, the, the plus of the musical. We find that it's an attempt in reenacting the music of a Nigerian act, uh, uh, icon outside the shores of Nigeria. And also an attempt in preserving the culture of Afrobeat, by extension, the culture of Nigeria. It's also a total uh, uh, theater performance concept which Fela actually stood for. And we find that the musical featured several songs, original songs of Fela Anikola uh, Bokuti from the beginning up to, to the end. And we find dress and fashion which uh, the, uh, the musical used as a tool for identification. And uh, through the musical, the cultural boundaries were highly demystified. And we find a situation where there's a melting point of, point of culture and where there's a confluence of culture, <coughs> which Fela also used during uh, his lifetime. But there are major criticisms of the musical. And that would take us to the point that a lot of critics really are hinging on about the musical. The dan dancers and choreographers in Fela's music differ a great deal from the typical Fela female singers with their costumes and makeups. Their costumes are typically more of the Broadway fashion than the African attires. And however, an aspect of the Fala dialogue too with the audience was missing, and that is what we call the yabiz. Yabiz is a major uh, style employed in getting the attention of the audience through dialogue. Fela is both a storyteller and a narrative singer, and this is brought to the fore in his yabiz sessions. But we find that that is not found in the Fela musical. The cast on the musical also operates a script which Fela never used. His linguist Franca was Nigerian preaching and he used the language regardless of the audience he was uh, addressing. There are also a few distortions to the lyrics of uh, Fela Nicola Kokuti in the Fela musical. Uh, Fela is portrayed in the musical as a self uh, appointed uh, spokesperson of the voiceless masses. And in doing that, they distorted some of his political ideo I mean, uh, uh, ideologies as uh, a, a social uh, fighter. I will read one of, the one, uh, one of the things he said. He says, I am fella. I've come to deliver you from the scales of poverty and political slavery. I want to be your president. Now, even though Fela had the ambition of being the president of Nigeria, he did not use the state performance as a campaign tool. He only used the stage to talk about the social ills of Nigeria. Another distortion of facts about the personnel of Fela is seen in the opening montage of the musical. Fela was quoted as saying in the musical, we are happy that so many of you are, being, uh, we are here tonight to welcome me back. But I have bad news. We they go. Me, the band, the girls, we are leaving Lagos. We are leaving Nigeria. The country has become too dangerous. This statement reveals a man wounded and battered to a point of going into exile. The real fella never went into exile, in spite of the harrowing experience he suffered from the military. He was one of the few activists that refused to relocate to other clans, to other countries, as a result of the threat to his life. He stayed in Nigeria till his death in 1997. And we also find a distortion to the lyrics in terms of the philosophy. Fela's musical music has a lot of lyrics which were substituted with other words in the musical that in a way alter the political ideology of the singer. Uh, an uh, example is in Water No Get Enemy, where the line says, if water kill your child, now water you go use. But it was now substituted with uh, if what I kill your child, we don't want that now. These, according to Onileku Wold, amount on Cessory Fela's intellectual property, which was against the ideology of Fela. And there was also this argument, too, that Fela's music was too serious to be confined to theater and the Broadway experience. 
They say people go to Broadway to, uh, to the theater to be entertained and not educated. So therefore it is encouraged that the intellectual contribution of fella be left to other mediums that would disseminate the information. While I share in that view that fellas really will uh, uh, lyrics should not be, be censured, censored or altered, I beg to disagree with the argument that fellas music would only be appreciated in other places other than the movie theaters. The shrine during fellas time were fashioned in form of theater and movie shows. Yet fellas would play the music with a retinue of exotic dancers and sophisticated spotlight. There are those who are also of the view that the musical compromise, uh, comprised of people mainly from outside Nigeria. They feel a musical of this magnitude should have Nigerians dominating the cast since Fela was from Nigeria. While I empathize with that view too, I need to say that the Afrobeat beat of Fela's years was a melting point of cultures. He recruited people from other countries outside Nigeria he had women dancers from Ghana, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Benin. Fela was a destabilized African. This was evident in the way he treated his band members who were not Nigerians. However, it is necessary to point out that the directors of the musical should allow more roles for Nigerians. And that is also seen in the way uh, some, some, some Yoruba languages were, uh, were, were said in the musical. Uh, for example, Omi Ola Tao. Omi Ola Tao means something else in Yoruba language. Omi Olota, that is water no get enemy. So there were a lot of distortion in the lyrics, and we feel if Nigerians were allowed maybe a, a, a position in the Fela musical, that would really have uh, helped in uh, making the musical much more credible in terms of the lyrics. In conclusion, Fela Musical is unique in the sense that the cultural and political sensitivities are con con conveyed through the songs and dance. Thus, the music is able to preserve, promote, and propagate the message. And the music of Afrobeat, which invariably is a message on the culture and politics of Nigeria, stands, uh, uh, can withstand the, the, the sense of time. The paper has demonstrated, therefore, that the music provides a convincing basis for global collaboration between Nigeria and the blacks in diaspora towards the propagation of our cultural heritage through music. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and, uh, as we progress at this conference. Uh, basically, today I'll be talking about kind of a really kind of small snippet in the career and life of Miriam Makeba. Uh, basically, what I'm arguing is that in 1968, her union with Stokely Carmichael ultimately kind of shifts her career path. Um, and as, as many of you know, Stokely Carmichael He's one of the co-founders of SNCC. He coins the term black power. Now, I'm going, to use the, I'm going to use the name Stokely Carmichael. He later changes his name, Kwame Torre, but because of the sources I'm using, I'm going to stick with Stokely Carmichael, just kind of keep a narrative. Um, but Mary McCabe, she arrives in the United States uh, in, in 1959 with Harry Belafonte, a chance meeting in London with Harry Belafonte. Now, Harry Belafonte in the 1960s is a huge, looming figure in American popular music, but also film, television. And his connections ultimately allow her to come to America, but also to kind of establish a performing career. Now, very quickly on, she's kind of lauded. She's a South African singer singing, quote, exotic songs uh, with, quote, uh, the weird tongue smackings of her native Osa language, that these kind of um, songs that she's singing are part of her repertoire back home, but in America, I mean, she's singing Osa, she's singing in Zulu, but American audiences don't, typically don't speak those languages, right? But she's 
singing in these, and she distinguishes herself from other performers, both from the diaspora, but also local American performers. And she's able to carve a very unique niche, and she's able to kind of become kind of a mainstream star in 1960s America. I mean, just to give you a sense, by 1962, uh, One Life magazine article um, uh, points out that, quote, almost everyone knows of Miriam McCabe. One ebony reader from Detroit stated in a letter to the editor, it should, should give us a new sense of pride to know that a talented singer like Mary McCabe, opening new paths and exploding myths about Africans and the colored people of African descent. I mean, she, she's appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show. She's regularly charting in the United States. Globally, she has a very good circulation figures. I mean, she is becoming a mainstream star in the United States, and part of that is because of her connections to a mainstream star of Belafonte. Now, uh, is this too loud, or am I? I'm hearing an echo, so. Uh, um, I like to yell, so my students will often complain. Uh, um, now, what happens with kind of Belafonte is that he's a mogul. I mean, he is, he's got these connections, and he's also kind of, though he's, funding a lot of civil rights organizations, though he's speaking for civil rights, he's kind of palatable to kind of the American mainstream or mainstreams. Um, and, and because of his mentoring of Makeba, she's able to go along with that narrative. She starts to speak out about South Africa. She's taking anti-apartheid stances. She's making speeches at the United Nation. And, but she's still kind of accepted by mainstream white America, right? She becomes uh, so popular that she's often credited with creating, kind of relaunching the hairstyle of the Afro. Uh, I mean, you can give and take, there's a debate about that, but I mean, you do see in the historical record that there is some proof of this. Uh, one Chicago shopkeeper told a, um, a New York Times reporter that McCabe, quote, gave Americans the chance to see it on television. And that's where it, the Afro, all started, right? Beyond the Afro, her clothing styles um, become kind of very chic, and so she, kind of, she starts making her own dresses. She's setting kind of a tone for kind of what the modern day sophisticated African and black woman should look like, right? I mean, she's fitting kind of the, the era that she's in. I mean, the early 1960s, you have rapid African independence, you have increased momentum behind the civil rights movement, movement, and she's able to kind of capture, ride this wave. Um, she's even starting to perform at SNCC events. She's raising money for MLK. I mean, some of this is an imperfect relationship. She will go out of her way, and she will point out that some American civil rights movements are, their funds are being invested in apartheid companies, and so she, so it, there's a tension, but she's very much part and parcel of kind of 1960s America. But in 1967, this changes. Uh, with the Six Day War uh, with Israel, she and Belafonte have a split. Basically, they've incorporated Jewish songs in their repertoire, and Makeba is being leaned on by a lot of African ambassadors to kind of move away from that, to show solidarity, at least temporarily. Belafonte makes the argument that, hey, this is a love song, right? We're, we, we can sing this. This isn't about politics. And they, too, basically agree to disagree, and they ultimately part ways. Um, both of them have different kind of points of view about this, and I can explain that during Q&A if you'd like. Um, but also, so as this split happens, Makeba goes back, goes to Guinea, right? She's tight with a lot of African presidents, Secretary, definitely one of them, and she goes to Guinea to kind of renew her feelings about Africa and kind of, re, kind of regain her energy. She writes in one of her autobiographies, uh, each time I go back to Africa, it is like being reborn, but it is bittersweet because I cannot really go home, not to the, to the place of my birth and my family, and uh, blah, blah, blah. For this reason, my collection of diplomatic passports grows and grows, right? She, she happens to be in Guinea right when Carmichael is there as well. He's on 
a political mission, but through different contacts, they're able to meet a Carmichael, and his autobiography kind of talks about him being fascinated with McCabe long ago. But here they really have conversations, and they leave this kind of chance encounter knowing that there's something going on. Let me keep secret. Uh, so what ultimately happens is it becomes, they keep this kind of relationship a secret, and then it starts to percolate out in the press. Uh, basically, in, in March 1968, Jet reports uh, an inkling of the Carmichael McCabe relationship first reached the whispering stage during a reception two weeks ago at an African embassy in Washington, D.C. The two appeared together, were attentive, and as she sang for the VIPs, Stokely's applause was louder for her for following songs of freedom. Later at the No Press Affair, the ambassador admitted that Miss McCabe asked that the name of the militant leader be put on the guest list. And so, and also in that very same issue, McCabe is described as Africa's most publicized artist, Carmichael as America's number one militant. Now this relationship, once it surfaces in the press, poses some problems. Uh, now, McCabe, she'd been politically active, but also she, she's often mostly critiquing apartheid, not um, the American mainstream, not American politics. And so what ultimately happens is once they are seen together, she's appearing at Carmichael's events. He's appearing at her stage performances. They, the two images get blurred together. And particularly, I mean, Carmichael is going through his own political transformations. And this has dire ramifications, or complex ramifications. Uh, one is McCabe is about to launch a clothing shop in the Bahamas. All of a sudden, her business permit gets pulled because she's associated with Carmichael. And when, when they get married in the early, early 1968, I mean, it becomes mainstream news. Uh, it's lauded as this Pan-African event. Uh, uh, just to give you a sense on kind of how Ebony, Ebony writes up about the guest list. The guest list testified to the unity theme of the event. It included representatives of free African nations, Afro-American jazz musicians, black ghetto businessmen and militants, and a score of the world's few decent white people. Uh, and so this, I mean, it goes on uh, down the road. It's, uh, they describe it as a symbolic joining of blacks in Africa and the United States. Or as the Ghanaian ambassador <coughs> described it, the beginning of stronger ties between black people on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, very quickly, this marriage, the, the marriage them, itself, but the, marriaging of these, the marrying of these two images changes the way Bakaba is described in the press. She's often referred to as Mrs. Stokely Carmichael, rather than Mary McCabe. Um, uh, very, very early on, this kind of Pan-African unity is starting to kind of break down, even within the black press. Like Carmichael's own persona is being part of the, an honorary member of the Black Panther Party. Kind of the politics of the era are shifting. And remember, the 68 is a major turning point in American politics. Uh, just to give you a sense, it's at this point where she starts being surveilled by the FBI, or so the FBI <coughs> has released to me right, through a FOIA request. Uh, by um, by J January 1968, they're starting to follow her movements. The CIA is doing the same thing. Uh, by June 68, they've compiled a pretty good database about her. Uh, October 68, they refer to her constantly as Mrs. Mrs. Stokely Carmichael. I mean, this has dire ramifications, but also in her performing career, a lot of her uh, set performances get pulled. The way she's described in the press changes. And Billboard, basically, it's saying, before this marriage, is saying she's on the verge of her next album being huge. After this marriage, she very rarely ever gets listed in Billboard ever again. 
Um, and so this pressure, this political pressure, starts to mount, and by the end of 68, they ultimately relocate to Guinea. And it's through Makeba's connections primarily that they're able to do that. I mean, that often gets forgotten is that how powerful and how well she connected she is. But even then, she's still surveilled by the FBI and CIA. Um, they take note of when she, what she's shipping to Guinea. They take note of what kind of items, like she buys two refrigerators and a washing machine, and they, send, they, they know that that's there. Um, they know which boat it's on. And it's constantly, because their fear often is that Makeba is raising money for the Black Panthers, for other black power movements, for Carmichael, and that she can be the money source. Um, and just to, I mean, this is kind of a side note, but kind of reading into the silences, but also the voices of these files in the FBI, uh, they have one uh, article from uh, Sweden, right, from Expressen, from February 1970. Right? The first question, you were on tour almost constantly, Mary McCabe. What drives you? How do you do it? You have been unwell and tired the whole time. <coughs> Her answer, the money drives me. But that's the only part, uh, that's only part of the reason I want to sing. Now, I say that to you because in the FBI file, they underline the money drives me. It's their narrative that they are worried that she's raising money. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover is actually trying to figure out what her actual status is as an immigrant, whether or not she's applied for United States citizenship. Um, I will end right. Uh, basically, as this wedding happens and as this marriage progresses and this relocation to Guinea, she gets kind of separated from the American mainstream, both politically but also physically. And ultimately, that helps kind of undermine a career that had a great deal of momentum going into the late 60s. Thank you very much. on Bembe music, the, the presenter talked about uh, 
the ritual aspect of uh, Bebe music, but he, well, maybe because of time uh, constraints, he did not mention the, uh, the, uh, the the line of movement of Bebe music even from the middle belt of uh, Nigeria, from um, the the the, the, uh, the they call the Tapa the Tapa people who worship a kind of masquerade known as Igono. That Bembe music is basically for that masquerade, but he doesn't mention the masquerade. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to comment on, on the last question? Then we'll come. Okay. Um, if you look at my topic, my focus was basically on the people of Obafemi mm -hmm. Wodo. This Bembe music is also performed in Cuba for the worship of um, Ocha called Lukomi, but I didn't say anything on that because that was not my area of focus. My area of concentration was just on Obafemi or the okay. local government. Okay. Okay. And you know, that was why I didn't say anything about you know, Tapa people. And then to your um, question, looking at the political aspect of Bembe music, um, it's, it's just a pity that you know, I didn't show the full um, video of the music. You would have seen the ladies you know, dancing as well. I mean, to the various steps of the music. And more so in that particular village, just only that family of Aifaya, they are the only people that perform that music. So you have the daughters you know, of these people. They are also involved in the band. Do you get what I'm trying to say? And when they are going out for political um, performance, they get these musicians, I mean the Bembe performers, to perform so that they can have the support of the, you know, the villagers. So both men and women, you know, go out along with them to perform. But it's not restricted, you know, to male. It's female can join the band, but mostly they, they are engaged in dancing, you know, going back and forth on the performance. But I've not seen any female singing the, you know, the, the best drum or you know, any of the musical instruments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hagen, did you want to respond to um, Yeah, I'm only to say that the origins of that drum are Vague because we don't know where it yeah, came from. Yeah, uh, that And the, that one the said terminology for areas of Africa or uh, that part uh, can vary according to what time period you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, it's not my terminology. I took that from the description that's provided by the British Museum. So, uh, and certainly, Gold Coast wouldn't be the proper terminology for the period either. So uh, I don't have any stake in, in what people want to call that <laughs> part of the world. Yeah, yeah because Ghana was never called Ivory Coast. No, no, uh, I'm, I'm no, aware of that. Oh, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just telling you that is how it is described. Oh, okay. That is how it's described by, in, in the, by the British Museum. Uh, uh, just the, it's a great question. I mean, what it is is that she, I can, when she, when she writes about it, in both her autobiographies, but also Carmichael, they are aware. This, I mean, part of the reason why they keep the secret early on, their courtship basically being, you can tell part of it is the politics. Part of it is also the age difference. She's about 10 years older, and so they're aware that other members of society or different societies could judge them for that. Um, but the impact, the kind of, the degree to which this happens, like I gave you the example from the Bahamas. She goes to the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, whose inauguration she sang at the year before. And so she, I mean, it was her connections to him that actually gave her the idea to launch that boutique. I don't think they ever imagined things like that were that she would be audited by the IRS down the road, think that there's how much America and through America, a good chunk of the world would kind of react to this. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions on the Philippines? Uh, this, I guess, I can talk to both uh, of the presenters on it. Um, I was thinking first about sort of the feminist aspects of the theme um, and the, the, the message that their performance conveys. Um, and then hearing about how things like costumes, and makeup were a source of critique um, in the production. I, I guess I'm just curious, from 
from both of your perspectives about how, on the one hand, um, makeup and costumes can be used as sort of a symbol of the, the sexual liberation that you were discussing, but also maybe, I, I, this is just me guessing, maybe like a misinterpretation of the culture um, for the sake of a Broadway performance. What, uh, the major critique in terms of the costume was the fact that uh, the Broadway performance made use more of Western uh, costumes. Oh, okay. Yes. And if you look at the Broadway, you find out that much of the, the costumes were Western oriented, not traditional attire mm -hmm. that Fella was already used to mm -hmm. in his performance. And that was what a lot of Fella uh, uh, disciples really kicked against. Because the, the costume was made more for the Western audience. The Broadway was intended majorly for the Western audience and not the African audience. So when the Broadway came to Nigeria, there was like an out of tune thing. When the, the Africans saw, it was like they didn't see Fela in the Broadway. They saw a lot of Western dancers with Western choreography. I mean, choreograph, and uh, that really uh, put them all off. So that's that's the major aspect in in, in the in the costume. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I got the same sense when I saw this performance, the Broadway performance in Chicago and Dallas. Uh, I got the sense there is this sense of ownership that fellow followers have to him that might potentially cause them to push back against this. Broadway aesthetic of, of Fela Kuti. Mm -hmm. But I think the approach I'm taking in my paper is not to look for how, how true to Fela is the Broadway performance, but how Fela's politics and ideology is being reimagined re, uh, re or reapplied to different political concerns in Broadway and outside of Broadway, um, in the US, in Japan, in, in, in Britain. I'm not in, interested in, co in continuity per se. I'm just interested in the signifying, mm. signifying to fella, signifying to the queen, but not being, not honoring through and through a true representation of, of, of fella or the queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're 10 minutes past, so I don't want to feel that, I don't want you to feel that you have to stay, but we are having a good conversation, so if we can have a few more questions, if no one objects, we want to yeah. do that. I wonder, and I have one. Yeah, I just want to, my question is directed to uh, uh, Rest of the Man. And um, I'm just a bit, uh, I just want to know, uh, in his uh, mention of the word musical, uh, he spelled it musical, musical with a T. E. E. So I want to know whether yeah. actually is it, is it musical, you know, or musical, interested in, of course, in the elusiveness of the queen, right? In how the processes through which the queen becomes a figure that emerges from a distinct, a distinctly post-colonial Nigeria. So there comes, uh, there, there, are, there are central, different forces that bring the queen to life, right? But I'm also interested in the ways that the queen eludes patriarchy and appears and disappears 
um, invites women to inhabit her and disappear again. Just that um, ephemerality of the queen. I'm interested in where she appears, how she appears, in whose body she appearing, and when, and why. explain what has made the marriage of Miriam and Teva inconvenient. And trying to uh, do something on the weed thing. Uh, so that's the way Fela looked at the whole thing. But it's an, but, it's an but, African for, for the children to call the father by their name. It is an African. Dr. Fleming, why was it inconvenient? Could you just call right on the coattails of that question about inconvenience very, very briefly? Can you maybe dispel to us the, the difference in the types of surveillance that, it, that occurred between Makeba's relationship with Masekela versus the one with um, Kwame Tori? Well, the, the, the files that have been released to me are basically all 68 on and up. And so, unless 
She appears in the Belafonte file, which we will not get in when, until, unfortunately, Belafonte passes away or a Congress changes the law. Um, but, and so with the files that I've received basically all start right around the time that her relationship gets, gets known basically to the public. But, I mean, also kind of these misread these readings of, of conven inconvenience, like, it's inconvenient for a lot of them how people react to this marriage. Uh, just to give you just two, Makeba, she writes and uh, she tells the press at one point, people have given a number of reasons for our marriage. Oddly, no one has thought of love. Right? I mean, and then Carl Michael points out uh, in his autobiography, next thing I know, the marriage is suddenly a symbolic union between black America and the continent, the motherland with the diaspora. Give me a break. That's one hell of a burden to load on one marriage. <laughs> Unifying black America and the African world? Come on, sounds nice, but be serious. And so, I mean, there's a lot of pressure, both kind of as a Pan-Africanist pressure, but also kind of other aspects, CIA, government crackdown pressure, et cetera, uh, music industry. So the inconvenience can be in a variety of ways. So. Right. Thank you to the presenters for staying on time. Thank you to you for staying a little extra time. Oh, yeah, yeah.